I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. You're tuned into a bonus rebroadcast episode of my recent appearance on the Mind Your Business podcast with James Wedmore. In this conversation, we'll talk about the way my life has changed since I began living by spiritual principles and my unique perspective on karma, steps you can take to improve the EMF levels in your home, and a common myth people have around radiation, and why the topics I and my podcast guests discuss tend to be so polarizing the self-built zoo we put ourselves in as domesticated humans, and how we can start getting back into alignment with nature, my take on vaccinations, my true purpose in life and business, and much more. Thank you so much for listening to this bonus rebroadcast episode. We'll be back to our regular programming this Tuesday with episode 316, A Spiritual Awakening with the David Hawkins Map of Consciousness featuring Clayton Stedman. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with today's very special guest, Mr. Luke Story. Luke, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. It's really good to see you. Yeah, thanks for coming on the show. It's uh, it's really it's an honor and pleasure to have you. I'm uh, like I was telling you before, I'm really excited to introduce you to my audience. I listen to your podcast nonstop, and I just feel like you are one of the most um, yes, like absolutely integrous individuals. It's so knowledgeable about so many different things and being so open hearted and giving in sharing that information. And you bring on these like unbelievable experts that are like doctors and stuff. And like, they can't get one by you. They're like, well, you know about blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah, you mean blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, how does, how does Luke know all of this stuff? So uh, it's such a knowledgeable conversation that's had over at the Lifestyles podcast. And we'll make sure to link that up. And you guys ha- got to have a listen. I'll probably link up a few of my favorite episodes. I first found you through researching the biocharger, which I got that. My entire audience, every time I post me doing it, they're like, what is that thing? And I've since listened to so many incredible episodes. I just got my Soma Vedic. And you know, I'd love if you could tell me, like, just to kind of start this off, tell me a little bit about how you describe what this podcast is. Like, who is it for? And even more importantly, like, why do you do it? The Lifestylist podcast is really born out of my own curiosity and my own passion for living an abundant, healthy, fulfilling lifestyle. And the reason that that passion exists is because there were so many years of my early life where I lived in the exact opposite manner. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, I had a pretty rough childhood and experienced a lot of trauma. And that led into the natural progression into many years of addiction and alcoholism and things got really dark and to the point of my mid-20s. And I had this incredibly graceful awakening and was able to turn things around. And when I did so, I started to recognize you know, the issues that I had around not only addiction, but just mental illness and physical illness. And I was just completely toxic from living, you know, the first part of my 20s in Hollywood and playing in bands and just being a complete maniac. And it's all fun and games until you stop and then realize like, wow, I feel like I'm 80 years old and I'm only 26, which was the case. So Mm. for me, the interest and passion in all of this was really born out of initial desperation. And then as I started to explore different means of achieving physical health and longevity and anti-aging and detoxing and all this, I also began to explore meditation and spiritual practices and yoga and running off to India and sitting at the feet of gurus and all of this stuff. And essentially, I just started to build a body of knowledge and an awareness of the different teachers and experts in all of those different fields. And having worked in the entertainment and fashion industry for about 17 years and eventually just really lost the passion for that because my passion just kept growing for the things that I just described in all things personal development and health and wellness that I eventually just couldn't stand doing what I was doing anymore. And so I needed to find a way to make the leap into the industry that I was an onlooker of and a fan of, but didn't have a way to really like insert myself into. And so when I started my podcast, it was a way that I could interface with so many of the experts and amazing people that I admired and learned from. And also I felt this sense of being 
just kind of an archivist or a researcher that would discover these amazing things like the biocharger and all of these inventors and doctors and esoteric spiritual teachers that were relatively unknown. And I had a dream of just building a platform where I could set about the world and do sort of immersive journalism and discover different modalities of healing and transformation and then share those with the with an audience. And that's what I started to do. And I started the Lifestylist podcast. And uh, from the very beginning, it was really well received and well shared and it's just continued to grow. And I just remain passionate about mm-hmm. it. Every yeah. interview I sit down, I mean, it's my friends that help me set up sometimes will joke. I'm always just psycho before an interview, setting up the lights and you know, <laughs> just getting everything perfect. And I, I prepare my manuscript. I'm very meticulous about that. I study every person I interview. I read their books. I watch all their videos. I listen to all their podcast spots. And it's kind of this frantic, energetic thing. And then once I sit down and turn those mics on, there's just something that happens to me. And I just become this just curious kid that's mm. just has this insatiable desire for knowledge. And once I apply that knowledge that I learn in my life and on my podcast, I'm just compelled to share it with other people because I'm someone who suffered so much earlier in life. And I know so many people are still suffering at the hands of some of the things that I struggled with. Yeah. So, you know, it's like if you find a solution to a problem that's pained you, unless you're just extremely self-centered, it's difficult to not go share that solution with people who are you know feeling that same kind of pain? Well, and that's and that's what I love in listening to you. you. It's it's very obvious. You can tell that you've done all the research and become knowledgeable. But yes, you're also applying it. And so I'm just curious, what does your life look like now in contrast to that 26 year old, uh, you know, toxic LA kid? Oh my god, dude! I mean, so oh, it's just it's incredible. So take. You know, let's say like 1995, 25 years old, living in Hollywood behind the Chinese theater. I might come to at 2 p.m. after having been up all night doing drugs until 9 a.m. Maybe I come to between 2 and 5 p.m. First order of business is have to procure more drugs, Mm. going into dangerous neighborhoods with dangerous people, just putting myself through the most degrading type of circumstances with, you know, just (laughs) very low energy people in low energy places and just living in complete desperation and fear and frustration and abject shame and loneliness and self-hatred, self-loathing, just enraged with the world and my place in it and just extremely angry, hateful, fearful person who, you know, found one method of temporarily treating that and that was by doing copious amounts of drugs and you know eating this fast food and you know smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and just really living at the bottom echelon of life just like a bottom feeder type yeah. person and completely self-centered and selfish and just all about my own survival and getting what I wanted and what I needed at the expense of other people and at the same time mm-hmm. still having some awareness that in some way I was meant for greater things than that. And I think that's that's the gift that I had then was even while I was that unconscious, there was this tiny seed in me, a mustard seed, I guess you could say that you could be better than this. That there has to be a way out of this life. And so that was kind of, you know, day-to-day life then cross-reference that with today, I'm 49 <laughs> years old and I live with the most amazing, beautiful, conscious, kind woman, my girlfriend, Allison. And I have the cutest dog ever named Cookie, who is usually here in the studio. And Allison, Siamese cat, Harry Gatto. I live in a a great house in Laurel Canyon in Los Angeles. And I have trees and an ice bath in the backyard and a sauna. And, you know, now I get up and just, I meditate for an hour. I watch the sunrise and do breath work. Uh, I, I wake up in a sense of prayer and communion with God and the creator. And when things do come up that aren't preferable, like stubbing the toe, the check didn't <laughs> come, the email the server crashed, you know, whatever the things that happen to just human life, it's like my level of frustration and, and resistance to reality is almost non-existent. And when I do resist something, it just doesn't last very long, you know? And so I just live in a completely different world where I'm able to really monitor my vibration and the level of consciousness with which I'm operating in life and really 
choose my own reality, as weird as that might sound. And I've, I've been able to, with the grace of spiritual practices and amazing teachers and guides and mentors and applying, as you said, some of the things that I've learned, I just have vibrant health and energy and I feel great. I look great. And even when things don't go my way, I have this amazing capacity to just surrender to the moment and be solution oriented and not get caught up in negativity, which is the only place I ever knew how to live. Mm. So just like everything I do every day is about building my energy reserves and using that energy to serve others. And, And I serve others because it's just, there's no other reason to live a life. Like why else would you ever be here Mm. if you weren't making a contribution because in the end, you know, really not in the end, but of all time, that's really the only thing that provides fulfillment is when you're, when you're contributing and adding value Mm. to the world and anyone that wants to interact with you or listen to you. So rather than, you know, in contrast where I was most of my life, just because I was hurt, it wasn't because I was a bad person. I was just desperate and in survival mode, but it was all about what I could get. And I was just living in a really rapacious kind of way, just constantly taking and taking and taking. And there was nothing left to give really, even though I had a good heart underneath that, I didn't have access to it because I just had to survive. And life was so difficult and just such a nightmare for me. And now, you know, it doesn't take a lot of energy to keep my own side of the street clean. And so there's plenty of room left to give and to share. Mm. And so it's its own reward. And I I fully understand the laws of karma now. And that, <laughs> yeah. you know, that karma isn't like, okay, if I'm selfish today, then I'm not going to get what I want or need later. Or if I go out of my way to harm other people or or just you know contribute negative energy to society in general, then later on, I'm going to pay the price. Or if I wrong someone and someone will wrong me someday... My life is based on karma and that karma is instantaneous. Mm. So in making a contribution or being of service to someone, it's not as if, oh yeah, and later on someone will help me. It's like, I am helping me in the moment that I'm helping someone else. Wow, that's beautiful. And it's not about being pious or being a good guy or showing other people out there, see what a good guy I am? I help people. Now I deserve it, yeah. You know, because that's all ego game too. Is like, look what a good person I am. Mm-hmm. You know, and been, I've been through that trip, all the different phases of that, and now it's just really authentically. I just really like to help ease people's suffering, and in so doing, I find that I suffer much less than I ever have before. Wow, that's amazing. And do you ever have those beautiful thoughts where you start to wonder, like, would I even be doing what I do today if it weren't for the the contrast of the experiences that you experienced, like in your twenties? Like, it's just so funny that you are you know, lacked so much health <laughs> and you talk about, you know, mental and physical health so much. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I would have been motivated to make the contribution that I make now had I not had that depth of suffering and had that contrast, yeah. you know, even having experiences over the past couple of years with plant medicines and, you know, shamanic journeys and these types of things where I've really got to see the depth of some of the horrific experiences I had as a kid and some of the trauma that I was subjected to and ways in which I was victimized and all sorts of things that I I was aware of. And I've been in therapy and 12-step groups and I've done all sorts of things to really heal the past. But I've had opportunities to look back at those experiences in greater detail and really see the depth of them and the impact of those experiences on my life. And just going like, wow, I can't believe I survived that stuff. A, B, I see where my motivation to help other people comes from mm. because I know what it's like to hurt, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, I can taste it. It's just, it's right at my fingertips, just that feeling of shame or just the feeling of just, you know, resenting other people all of the time and, and just the feeling of just walking around being a hateful person. And so when I encounter people that are still in that energy field, if they, have the willingness and the desire to rise out of that, I found a way, I found a path, you know? And I don't know that if I, if I hadn't suffered in the ways that I did when I was younger, I don't know that I would be that motivated. I think it would just be about, you know, the 401k and <laughs> a white picket fence and just kind of putting all the pieces together on the outside and just living an average life. And, and there's nothing wrong with living an average life. But yeah. because my early life was so extreme, my life now on the lighter side, you know, going from the Darth Vader archetype to the Luke Skywalker <laughs> archetype, no pun intended. I'm just as hardcore about the light now as I was about the darkness before. Mm. 
So yeah, the dedication and fervor with which I sought out my addictive behaviors and things like that, I have the same dedication for exploring you know, the most cutting edge biohacking technologies and anti-aging regimens and things like that and, and all the experts uh, behind those things too. It's just like I'm just super committed because I've always been committed. I'm just now I'm fighting for the good guys <laughs> instead. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, I get, you know, I'm sure our listeners just in hearing, you know, this backstory up until this point are already getting a sense of like the breadth of your knowledge and how deep it goes and every area is associated to, you know, whether it's physical, mental or spiritual health. And, you know, part of me is like, oh my gosh, where do we begin? Where do we start? Like, what's the biggest thing? But you did mention, you know, today you you see that you've been able to choose and create your own reality. It's not weird to say that on this show. We talk about it all the time. I did want to talk to you about so many of the, you know, biohacking and physical health stuff. So I wonder if that's a great place to start. Do you draw a natural connection and correlation to your physical health and well being and like anti aging with the whole idea of like being more intentional and mindful and creating your own reality? You know, it's interesting. After having interviewed people like Bruce Lipton and Mm -hmm. Joe Dispenza, whose work is all about the quantum field and infinite potentiality and this idea that you create your own reality by the types of thoughts and feelings that you entertain. And in so doing, can also manifest incredible levels of healing, health, and vitality using your mind, your intention, and these various practices that people like that promote and develop. And on one side, I think that one could be a little less disciplined about their physical health and really build a robust internal landscape in terms of the way you observe the world and interface with reality and the depth of your meditation practice and how much you can be connected to that field of consciousness and not be completely obsessed with the health of your body. And this is this fine line that I'm always kind of walking right. in myself. Uh, and an example of that would be it's just kind of a self-awareness thing that I'm playing with right now a lot. Let's take something where I would consider, if not the most detrimental threat to all life on earth, but just specifically humans would be the proliferation of EMF fields in our environment. Mm-hmm. And you know, this is now going into, you know, from 4G to 5G in terms of radio frequencies in in our atmosphere where we live and not to mention the 60 hertz in your house and magnetic fields from uh, appliances in your house and power lines over your house and geopathic stress from water lines running into your house and you know we just really are we're energetic electric beings yeah we, we really are you know we're electric and so you know to me that is if someone was going to work on their health, that would be the number one thing I'd work on. Number two would probably be your exposure to non-native blue light after dark and even during the day to some extent. And we can go into those things, but to bring it back to your point, the psychology of health versus the physical practices that help you to achieve health. So you can look at something like, okay, I live in an environment where I know there's some cell towers nearby. Not Mm -hmm. too close now, thankfully. (laughs) A few up in the hills here, a little closer than I would like, but the uh, you know the radiation levels in my home aren't out of control, but they're still you know I'm, it's not like I'm camping. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. One side of that is the reality on hard science is that right now, as I speak, I've got a Wi-Fi router about oh, ten feet away from my head, and if you tested the EMF levels in this room and had them tested by an expert who's knowledgeable about how to detect them properly, and then you took those readings and that information to someone who understands the biological effect of radiation in your environment, I am technically being harmed right now just sitting Mm. here, just from what's in my home and what's around my home, right? And even the electrical fields coming off my computer, etc. So where do I draw the line with having that awareness and acknowledging that is in fact true, that, you know, the Calcium gated channels in my cells right now are being flooded with calcium because there's radiation in the environment. That's what happens and inflammation and immune system suppression, et cetera. And I've experienced acute radiation exposure from living very close to two cell towers unknowingly for three years. Mm. Um, And during that time, even as healthy as I am and how much effort I put into my physical health, I was extremely ill. So let's say I know that on a conscious level and intellectually and scientifically that's verifiable. 
the compound effect of me sitting here and having anxiety and having a limbic system that's on fire, being in a sympathetic nervous system state and worrying about and being afraid of the Wi-Fi router that's sitting there has a compound effect of suppressing my immune function even yeah. more than just the router sitting And there. that's scientifically proven. You get into that, that constant fear state, your immunity is going to get affected. Yeah. And so... You know, there's a there's a fine line there between okay, how much can I use the realm of of quantum physics to actually change the way I'm observing something to mm-hmm. affect the way that it presents itself, yeah. which is you know, a very fundamental and basic way to explain one element of quantum physics. When you observe something, just by your observation, the nature of that thing changes, the behavior of that thing changes, right? right? So, yeah. The cells within my body are going to change if I'm sitting here constantly ruminating on the fact that there's a cell tower, you know, a quarter mile up the road and there's a Wi-Fi router in my office here. So do I just ignore the Wi-Fi router and just move my house right next to a cell tower and use mind over matter and just bless myself and love myself and consider myself safe? Maybe, <laughs> but how about I combine both where I I get a basic understanding of these things, I build awareness and and at the same time be very mindful about crossing over that center line into fear and anxiety and paranoia over things which I have very little control. Mm. Yeah, I could choose to have no cell phone and I could choose to not have a computer. Right. But the fact is I live in 2020 and uh, especially for the work that I do, these things are necessary and I appreciate them. So it's a balance of building awareness and educating myself and doing what I can in a reasonable way to mitigate some of those threats and also keeping the understanding and the <laughs> the realistic and valid worldview that I am not this body, that I am consciousness and awareness inhabiting this body. And from that perspective, I actually can't be harmed by a mm. cell tower or a Wi-Fi router. Wow. Yeah. You know, and so living in a place where I understand this might sound really far out to people listening, but you know, let's just say you're sitting there and you watch yourself have a thought. You know, you go, What what's going on with you today? And you go, Oh man, I just I can't stop thinking about this thing. Well, who's the one observing you thinking about the thing? <laughs> That's the real you. That's Mm. consciousness that's observing the phenomenon of thought, feeling, of sensation as we go through our life. And, you know, one doesn't have to necessarily buy into the framework of reincarnation or that you're a soul in a body. A lot of people find solace in just the framework of thought and belief that they are their body, they are their mind, they are their feelings, that they're a finite piece of flesh. But I think most people that do a bit of critical thinking and a bit of exploration and spend some time meditating will eventually arrive at some understanding that you are much more than a body. And so how can we take care of the body in a reasonable way, in a, in a realistic, non-paranoid way, and also understand that at a certain point in time, in, in space and time, we're going to abandon this body and that who and what we are is going to, in fact, continue on. Yeah. And you know, again, this is just, I'm going to be unapologetic. This is just my my worldview, it's the sense that I get, it's the knowing that I get when I meditate and I travel into other dimensions or take plant medicines or psychedelics in a therapeutic or reverent way. And I become very clear that I'm not my body because Mm -hmm. I'm aware of things that are by far outside of my current immediate physical reality. And so the physical health piece is really tricky because I don't want to just go drink aspartame, Diet Coke, eat GMO <laughs> corn all day, drink a pint of vodka, smoke a pack of cigarettes, you know, sleep with my head next to a Wi-Fi router, move my house next to a cell tower, drink fluoridated water, you know, and just go, well, if I meditate and I, you know, I believe that there's a higher power and I believe that I'm not my body, I'll be safe. Yeah. I don't think that that's a good strategy either. So it's about educating yourself on the fundamentals of health and What's the low-hanging fruit and the easiest things to change in our physical environment or lifestyle that leads to suffering and pathology on the physical level and then really working to understand consciousness from a point of view where we can start to understand the framework that I just described and not as an intellectual construct, but as a felt sense of being and experience. So I can be here chatting with you remotely on a Zoom recording and I know that 
the the beingness and the consciousness communicating with your consciousness is not Luke's story. Just like I know you're not James Wedmore. Those are labels that we've been given while we're in this body and we're here to have this experience. So it's kind of, for me, about finding the balance of keeping one foot in, in the physical concrete world and one foot in the metaphysical, non-physical, non-linear, no space, no time world. Yeah, And that's a bit of a dance because yeah. sometimes in one way or the other and you get caught up by either one because you get too spaced out and become you know captain meditator and then all of a sudden <laughs> you forget to pay your rent you know mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. or you just renounce all possessions and you know move off to the himalayas and live in a cave and and that's an option too but you know that's not my dharma personally as it's played out so far so i got to be in the world but not of the world i just think that's so beautiful that you started there that you're you still are finding that line, walking that line. And because I've definitely found myself there and you notice, you observe, like you start researching something. Like I remember, like I found myself in college really overweight. Uh, I was 225 pounds. And so you're like, okay, I think I'm going to figure this out. And you start realizing the things that you're eating are bad for you. Right. And so then you're, it's it's just the classic example. Like I know I shouldn't eat this (laughs) and then you eat it. And it's just like, you're filled with that guilt. And then, and then you're just guilty for like the next three hours calling yourself a fatty. And then you start waking up to this and you're like, I wonder how much of like what's really causing you know a lot of that. But even in your episode with Bruce Lipton, he said, you asked him about the 5G stuff and his response was similar to like, yeah, if you believe that it's harmful, then it's going to harm you. Yeah. And so I can really get that. Like you can have somebody on one hand say, let me share with you scientifically. And I've talked to someone, I've talked to somebody Locally, to me, neighbor who's an electrical engineer, he graduated top 50 in his class at MIT, and he just sat there, you know, nerding out on me on the all the science behind what you know what 5G does. And you know, there it is. And then on the other side of that, you have someone like Bruce Lipton saying, Well, well, if you believe it's bad for you, it's it's gonna harm you. you know? I could sum it up like this: my approach is yeah. trust God, tie up your camel. Yeah. And you've shared that. Can you actually elaborate on the on that <laughs> metaphor and where that comes from? As a cowboy would say, trust God, tie up your horse. But I'm assuming the term (laughs) came from biblical times or somewhere, you know, in in the Middle East where they have camels. It's this idea that there are things that you can change and there are things that you can't change. And you can pray for the wisdom to know the difference between those two Mm -hmm. options. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so, you know, I could put my Wi Fi router on a timer, which I did. Trusting that I'm going to be okay, but I'm tying up my camel. I, I'm not going. Why keep the Wi-Fi router on and be radiating the house with 2.4 gigahertz yeah. while I'm sleeping? There's no. I don't need it. You right. know what I mean. But being paranoid, conversely, on the other side would be just unwiring the whole house and just you know living in a cave and being cut off from the world. So it's like you take whatever steps you can to improve your environment, uh, to make your environment and your lifestyle healthier, but also just know that you're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Even you know, looking back on you know, a year and a half ago when I, <laughs> to my horror and shock, discovered that... And I'm very EMF sensitive and EMF knowledgeable and aware that I had unknowingly been living about... you know, I don't want to exaggerate, but realistically, if I could measure it, it's probably... My bed was probably about... 50 to 75 yards from two massive cell towers, like with multiple bars of those towers, you know, how they're kind of those long four foot yeah. bars and multi, you know, there's probably six or eight of those pointed right at my bed that was on the third story of a building across the street and they were hidden. I'm on the second floor. So you add like, you know, 12 feet height difference and whatever it was, half a football field or so away, I'm getting blasted with radiation. Okay. So when I discovered that, of course, it explains so many of my health problems, this profound level of brain fog, waking up with intensely painful headaches. Uh, my vision went bad. I started to have to wear glasses. I mean, sometimes it was really difficult to drive a car. I mean, I felt unsafe driving my car. My brain fog was so intense. So, you know, the trust God part would be, well, it's fine. Let me just stay here and I'll meditate more and I'll just know that all is well. No, I got my ass in <laughs> action and I moved as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. When I came and looked at this house, I brought my RF meter. I tested the atmosphere in here and I said, all right, I'll take it. Where do I sign? And I was done and I was out and I did that, you know? And so it's like, the funny thing about that to the Bruce Lipton point is I was being harmed by that radiation even when I didn't know it existed. Right, right. So, like it wasn't a nocebo effect. I wasn't making myself fall ill and lose my vision because I was so paranoid about the cell towers. I literally didn't know they were there. Yeah. 
you know, so once I discovered that, there was this fear response, this anxiety. I was pissed off, right. you know, at the the owner of the building. It was they're also right above a school, mm. and so yeah, that was a, it was a really kind of traumatic experience because I'm someone who's so committed to my health, and it just it was really impeding my ability to do my work in the world, and it was so difficult to do my interviews and just keep my shit together, yeah. you know, frankly. But I did it. I prevailed, and then I moved out and. You know, now uh, having paid that price, I'm a bit more knowledgeable, and now I'm I'm much more passionate about that particular issue, having been someone that had that experience. But at the same time, it's like there's just so many things that are just out of your control. Yeah. Even now, with Elon Musk sending these, you know, whatever five G you know, space, he's yeah. sending his since that he tweets about it, he's so proud of it. I I'm kind of a dick. I've been tweeting at Elon <laughs> Musk and being like, really, dude, like. <laughs> This is your. This is what you're leaving for your grandkids. Honestly, like get out of here. Yeah. But anyway, it's another story. But I, I do like that. You know, trust God and 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 don't go get paranoid. And we all we all do this. We all know this with certain things. Like the, the analogy I use is that most of us every night don't lay up in bed thinking, "Is somebody going to break into my home tonight?" We still lock our doors, right? Right. And I. Great. I think it's the same thing. And this is a sign I've gotten interested in. And yes, I've done research and learned. And you notice yourself get into some fear and anger. And then to come back to what you said, which is the most simple phrase, I think is like the best affirmation, the best context is that everything's always going to be okay. You know, everything's going to work out. And you're more than just this body is beautiful. I recently got the Soma Vedic because you recommended it. So a lot of people saw my stories and thanked me, but I want to make sure everyone knows that that was Luke's recommendation. He did a whole video on it and everything. Could you tell us about that and a, a few other tools, products that we can use the same way, folks, that you buy, hopefully, before you get broken in, your home security system. <laughs> you know, most people go out and buy a security system after they've been broken into. Hopefully you're proactive with it. But this is the same type of thing. It's just about being safe and being smart. What type of recommendations do you have for us? Well, when it comes to the EMF issue and electromagnetic fields, EMFs, right? These are invisible waves of different types. I described a couple of the different types that exist in our environment and some of them are even in frequencies that are present in nature, and some of them are frequencies that are never, ever present in nature, never have been, never will be. The fact remains, whether those particular frequencies exist in nature or not, the level and the power behind them that we experience now in our modern lives is not. And so, mm. you know, we kind of talked a little about why you might want to you know, build a little bit of awareness around that. And once you do, again, like staying out of the fear, but what can you do to mitigate it? And so I think the first thing that's really important for people to do is listen to some podcasts and watch some YouTube videos with experts that are talking about it. I'm sure as you know, I've done a number of shows with engineers, with scientists, with biologists, with doctors, a neurologist, all kinds of different people. And I tend to ask them, even if the episode isn't even about that, I'll say, hey, what's your take on this? Or even Bruce Lipton, mm -hmm. you know, which is coming from more of a consciousness perspective because I want all sides. So becoming a little bit educated about these things while you know observing the level of fear and anxiety around it is the first thing. But what begins to happen for people as they build this awareness is because we are all built with the instinct for survival, we start to uncover some of the facts, some of the science on this. The natural reaction is like, oh my God, I'm being hurt right now by the Wi-Fi router in my house or right, my cell phone right. you know, next to me. And so then you have that fear. And so what people want to do is they want to run out and buy the meters themselves. And they want to find ways to you know, shield themselves in their home and things like that. And having been through a lot of that research and toying around with these things myself, the place that I've arrived, and I'll get into some of the solutions that you can apply, but the place I've arrived at, honestly, is the number one thing you should do with your money is find a building biologist. That's a person who does home assessments for EMF levels. In Southern California, there's a guy, I mean, he's probably going to get blown up now, but his name's Oram Miller. You can find him online, O-R-A-M, Oram Miller. He's one of the leading advocates for safety testing and you know lobbying for protection from 5G rollout and things like this. He's, he's kind of an activist, but he also does home assessments. Uh, there's another guy named Brian Hoyer that's been on my show who lives, I forget, Nebraska or somewhere, but he travels and does kind of city tours and does home assessments. Whether or not it's either of those two guys is irrelevant. You want someone that has experience and really knows what they're doing and they'll come into your home 
uh, anywhere from, you know, depends on the size of your home. If you're in a, you know, a studio apartment, it's going to be considerably less because it'll be less time they spend. If you have a 3,000 square foot home somewhere, it'll be more. But you know, you're looking at approximately 500 to maybe $1,200 for them to come out to your house for a day. And just like you'd have a mold inspection or mm-hmm. any other, you know, sort of toxic inspection of your home. And I would also recommend uh, mold inspection. <laughs> yeah, that's another episode. <laughs> mold can wreck your life yeah. as bad, if not worse than EMS, depending on how high the EMF levels are. But they'll come in, they're trained, they understand how to use and read those meters. And the meters that are necessary now to really detect the severity and the different frequencies present of all the types of EMFs in your home, you're looking around twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of equipment to mm. really do it right, if not more. I mean, some of the meters are thirty thousand dollars just for one meter. Wow. Yeah. So you know these these are technicians, these are engineers, these are people that really understand the nuances of that science. So you don't. Rec- I've seen these like two to four hundred dollar things on like Amazon and stuff. I'm going I'm to get to that, okay. actually. The lowest hanging fruit is like, okay, I like to know what my numbers are every month. Am I going to go get a degree in accounting? No. <laughs> but should I learn how to read a p and l Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. You see what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to be a bookkeeper and accountant. But when I talk to them, I want to have a basic understanding of the information they're sharing with me and that, what they're aggregating for my view, right? So... You know, you don't have to become an EMF expert. The first thing you do is you hire one of them to come in and then they're going to make an assessment. And sometimes you'll find that you're a lot better off than you expected yourself to be. Sometimes people that live very near the coast find very low levels of EMF because it's only coming from one direction and that's behind them. So, you know, you just never know. Like I'm in a canyon here. And when I first moved here, for example, I did a little testing on my own and I'll explain how you can do that. And I found the RF levels, that's uh, cell towers, Wi-Fi, radar, things like that were quite low in this house. And I was like, I'll take it because my (laughs) prior experience, as I indicated, was quite to the contrary. Uh, And I move in here and I did a little self-testing. Then when I had Brian Hoyer come over here, which will be... I don't know if I'll have that ready by the time this comes out. But if it is, I'll I'll put it in my show notes. I made a two-hour documentary of getting my home scanned. So I just kind of remember that. It's it's really well shot, very thorough. Everything you could ever want to know about what a home assessment looks like and what they find, you'll see in there. But he comes over and he discovers a magnetic field right around the bed. You know, and I would have never known to look for that, and I wouldn't have known the cause. The cause of it was some bad wiring in the house, and so the the sixty hertz uh, grid, the wiring within the home, was just not grounded right. So it's creating this insanely destructive magnetic field in my house. And even if I was able to detect that, I'd have a very hard time knowing where it was coming from or how to fix it. So when you bring a, a mitigation expert to come in. They're going to give you hopefully very accurate readings and really assess your situation. And what you thought was a problem might not be a problem. You might have one that you didn't know about. So that's the number one thing. And and typically what the recommendations is going to be, depending on the severity of your issue, is to shield your bedroom. And you can shield your bedroom a number of different ways. The most cost-effective and most efficient way to do it is by measuring the levels. Then you have the bedroom painted with a special paint that's a shielding paint. You get the special fabric that you would then have sewn on the back of your curtains or blinds so that nothing's coming through the windows. And then depending on what floor you're on, you might put something on the floor under the rug or put a rug at least under your bed to block your bed. The idea there is you want to start where you spend the most amount of time, which is first where you sleep Mm -hmm. and where you work if you work at home like we do a lot. So you have an assessment done, you take their recommendations, they're going to recommend experts that can come in and help actually build out the mitigation. Even sometimes like the cheapest thing to do is, is build your bed into a Faraday cage using shielding fabric. If you're somewhere really bad and you can't move and you can't drop 10 grand on like shielding your whole bedroom, that's an option. And what is a Faraday cage? Is that what, what you would call shielding your room? Well, uh, you essentially, when you have your ho- a whole room shielded, you're effectively turning that room into a Faraday cage where okay. no fields can enter and no fields can get out. So in a Faraday cage, that's where all RF fields uh, are cut off. So essentially, you would go in your room and your cell phone would not work. You'd get no signal if it was wow. shielded, right? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So then you hardwire. You, know, you get Ethernet cables in your home and you get adapters to go into your iPhone, your laptop, whatever. But you can also build a smaller version of a Faraday cage around your bed using shielding fabric. Now, Mm. 
to do that in a way that doesn't look ridiculous like a mosquito net. We're not there yet. <laughs> but I think as 5G rollout increases and the level of radiation in our environment becomes worse and people become more aware of that, that savvy investors and entrepreneurs are going to come up with products that are effective, that are highly functional, easy to use, simple to set up, simple to take down, and that don't look completely hideous and ruin the whole aesthetic of your house. That would be the route to go full professional. But in terms of your question about meters, there are meters you can get for two, three, four hundred dollars on Amazon that will test uh, electric fields, magnetic fields, or RF fields, you know, radiation levels. And they're useful in a sense because you can see if something's really bad and also find the source of something. So I usually travel with a little electric field meter and an RF meter. So if I get in a hotel room, I'll just kind of scan it. I mean, it sounds a little paranoid, but it's actually quite useful. I stayed in a a hotel in Mammoth. It was like this little cabin, for example, uh, last year. And I had my RF meter and I I walked in and, you know, my girlfriend at the time thought I was insane, of course, because I kind of am. But (laughs) again, I look at people that don't do that. You're actually insane. (laughs) I found was I went in the, I was like, wow, it's a really high RF level and we're in the middle of the woods here. What's going on? Mm. And so I follow the beep, 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 you know, it's like the field gets stronger, the little lights light up. And I was like, holy crap, there's a Wi-Fi router behind the headboard of the bed, which is, that is, you know, I don't care how, like, if you have a basic fundamental understanding of EMF, like no one says it's a good idea to sleep with a Wi-Fi router one foot from your head. Like that's really, really dangerous, especially in the long term. For a couple nights, you know, you're going to survive. Yeah, but you're probably going to wake up with a pretty bad headache. So that little meter was good enough for me to unplug that router when we went to bed every night. But it wouldn't be good enough to assess a whole home because I don't know how to read it. It's not telling me what the different frequencies are in terms mm. of like, oh, is that a cell tower down the street? Is that the Wi-Fi router? Is that my Sonos system? Is that my Dyson heater that's Wi-Fi? You right. know, it's like, is that Bluetooth coming off my trackpad on my computer? There's just no way for you to tell that if you're not a professional. But it is good for the low-hanging fruit, especially when you travel and you're outside of your environment to determine the basic levels and also to find the source of them too. So that's about as far as I would go with trying to do it yourself because you're just going to waste time and money because you're not trained. I mean, mm-hmm. these building biologists that are trained, they spend, I don't know, you know, the equivalent of probably months in training in order to just be skilled enough to accurately assess someone's office or home in order to tell what's going on. I mean, it really is, it's quite technical. And so to try to figure that out yourself as a lay person, I don't think is a good long-term strategy. Yeah. Into the other mitigation tools that you mentioned, like the Soma Vedic, the tricky thing about EMF, and we'll just use RF radio fields or radio frequencies, which again, would be your cell tower, your Wi-Fi, any Bluetooth appliances, and any smart meters on your home or on the the home next door, a smart meter being the meter that doesn't have that old school little dial that spins around slowly, but looks more like a digital clock. There's all sorts of different types of smart meters. Some of them are horrendously high in EMF. Some of them, not so much. Some of them go off continuously. Some of them pulse every couple hours and send a signal to the mothership to establish the levels of usage, You know how much electricity you're using, etc. But even things like you know your Wi-Fi enabled doorbell and right. you know, ham on your door. There's just there's all sorts of different sources from it. And so when you've become accustomed to living in that way and you've gotten addicted to wirelessness, <laughs> which I have. I mean, I have Sonos speakers in my house. I've tested them. <laughs> the EMF from those things is off the charts. It's like having like ten Wi-Fi routers in your house. No. It sucks. Currently, though, I'm I'm leasing this house, so I don't want to drop. You know, twelve hundred bucks to have some guy come over here and like wire the whole house when right. I'm probably going to move in the next few months. So you know, it's just it is what it is. So it's like you have to weigh the cost to benefit ratio. Is the vibe that I get from having Spotify on demand throughout my whole house? Do I get like enough joy and pleasure <laughs> from that that I'm willing to take the hit from the radiation? Yeah, I've decided it's worth it. Okay, yeah, otherwise yeah. I can unplug them. Am I too lazy to get up and turn on my Dyson heater? Yeah, I like just being able to do it on my phone. Okay. <laughs> so, because I'm addicted to technology and wirelessness, and you know, it's such a hassle to walk over and plug something in because I've become that lazy. <laughs> done is I've installed some devices in the house. Uh, one of them being this device you described called the Soma Vedic, which is essentially a little. I've actually got one for your video. I've got yeah, one there it is. It's so, yeah, like gold it's, flying saucer. 
Medica. That's the that's the Amber Medic, I believe it's called. And I, I have them all over the house, probably four or five, which is overkill. They're just they're one of my affiliates, so you know I got a deal and it's whatever. But the way that device works, there's also one called the Blue Shield B L U, no E, but B L U Shield. They're out of New Zealand. They work differently, but have the same net effect in that they harmonize the environment that you're in so that biologically your electric body attunes to those frequencies rather than attuning to the harmful frequencies of the RF, the Bluetooth, the Wi-Fi in your environment. The thing that people get caught up on is they think something doesn't work or isn't scientifically valid if it doesn't block the radiation. If you block the radiation coming from your Wi-Fi router, which I can do, I have some fabric in my closet where the router is and I'm working in here and no one else in the house needs Wi-Fi because I don't need it to work on my computer. I'm Ethernet. Mm-hmm. I'll put that fabric over it and I drop the radiation to down to you know 10% or something out of 100. And so it's very effective. But when you block radiation, your signal doesn't work anymore. Right. So that's the thing. And so people will look at something like the Soma Vedic or the Blue Shield, which make a scalar wave technology, which again is, is something that emits frequencies that are supportive of your health and your biology rather than the negative effects of RF, like a microwave oven or any of those other things we described. People get caught up on the science. Well, if it's not blocking the radiation, then it's not doing anything for me. And these devices to me are useful and they're helpful for someone like me who doesn't want to just get rid of everything wireless in my house because it's just not practical right now. Now, when I move and I buy my own place, everything in the home will be hardwired. And I'll only have Wi-Fi to turn on manually when it's an emergency and I have a bunch of people over and they need to use Wi-Fi. I'll shield the bedroom. If I had kids, I would shield their room, maybe even before my own room. And then I would still install these devices because you're still getting radiation coming from the atmosphere and now from these cell towers. And if you live near an airport, there's you know, radar coming in from the airport. Mm. Or if you live by a military base, you're getting blasted with RF. So... These devices aren't the be-all, end-all solution because they're not blocking the radiation, but they are creating a more harmonious field within the home that helps you to get into that parasympathetic state and relax and be less susceptible to the tension created by all of these frequencies that are permeating through your house. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's something that I think it's important for people to understand with these devices because they're expensive, you know, three, four, yeah. six, eight hundred dollars that's not the final solution, but it's a really good first step to put something like that in your home and office. And most of the time, unless you have a just a palatial estate, it's 5,000 square feet or something. Most of the time, one of these devices will create a strong enough field to take care of your whole house or your whole office. I even take them on a plane. I blast everyone wow. on a plane you know, with these, these harmonics. So they have fields. like battery powered ones then? Well, they have USB. And, oh, okay. Okay. I'm a picky traveler, so I'll, I'll travel less frequently and get a business class or first class ticket because I just, I'm tall and uncomfortable yeah. and sitting for a long period of time. So I usually have an outlet, you know, Got it. but some of them have a USB or things like that. Point being, I even have them in my car. I have a Blue Shield, the auto version. I have the little baby Soma Vedic, which is on a USB that goes in the lighter in my car. So everywhere and anywhere I go, I have some sort of harmonic device that's helping to minimize the negative effects. But it's just important to understand that it's not going to block it per se. Because again, if you block it, nothing works. Right, right. So when you go into like blocking all the radiation in your home, that's when you hire a specialist to come in and none of your stuff works anymore. So you have to hardwire everything (laughs) to make it work. I just did that for my girlfriend up in our bedroom where we kind of made a ad hoc office for her and the Wi-Fi up there sucks. And so when she tries to live stream, it doesn't work. So I actually ran an Ethernet cable out of this room, on the side of the house and through the window up there and then got her an adapter so she can plug in her iPhone or plug the Ethernet into the back of the iMac up there. And you know it's great. The service yeah. is a million times faster and awesome. And if the signal's low up there, it's fine. So you know if you just adjust your habits a little bit and you have the means to do so, you can go back old school and really hardwire your whole house. I mean, even those Sono systems come with Ethernet cables. It's just... Who's going to take the time to run the cable through every room? It's totally. a pain in the ass. No yeah. one wants to do it. Yeah. The thing with most health practices, I find as someone who people come to for advice and direction on these things, most of the things I recommend people won't do anyway. Because <laughs> it's just... It's inconvenient. Right. 
Yeah. You know? But anyway, that's a really kind of a long winded deep dive into all things EMF. And I think that's the most important thing to deep dive on because, mm. again, in my opinion, and based on, you know, I've done 300 interviews with health experts from all over the world. And the ones that are knowledgeable about this topic say that that's the number one thing that you should fix first. And I'm glad we started there and did go as deep as, as we did. So, so thank you. I know you've mentioned a few other things that I hopefully we can have some time to just briefly go over and kind of open that door for people to to go deeper. And we'll make sure to link up episodes because you can you guys can just tell from when Luke starts talking about the topic, he's going to go you know deep, far and wide with it. That way, you become knowledgeable. No, it is it's funny, man, because we uh, <laughs> led a, a live stream today, and it was a like a guided meditation, and my girlfriend's a shaman, so she. Took people on a journey and we, we just took a walk before this and we were just we were talking about how it went and she went yeah it's just it's interesting for me because we're new at doing these things together we've done them on our own for a long time so yeah it's interesting to do things with you because you talk a little while and uh you know she was politely saying like wow dude like can you learn how to you know <laughs> chop it down a little bit into bite-sized pieces but you know again man it's like this is my passion i just yeah. I know there's people like me that are living next to a cell tower and wondering why they're sick and going mm. to the doctor every month with the flu or whatever, losing their vision as I did yeah. and these issues. And they have no clue that like they don't even know what a cell tower looks like and that there's one right on the phone pole next to their bedroom. I mean, I drive around Hollywood now and we have this really expensive health food store called Erwan. You know, I've been shopping mm-hmm. there for 30 years and uh, it's great. It's just you're going to get three things and it's $300. <laughs> but you know, God bless them, at least they're there. They have a, a cell tower, you know, right above their the dined outdoor dining area, which is underneath an apartment building. So this cell tower, which is a really powerful one, I've actually tested it, which I've got a video on it. It's going to be included in that the series I told you about. And there's people whose living rooms and bedrooms are about 30 feet from that cell tower. Mm. And because they've never heard a podcast like this, they have no idea. And I'm not even exaggerating. Living in a place like that for a year can give you brain cancer. I mean, this isn't like a scare tactic. This is reality. Yeah. If you if you research cancer clusters around schools, you'll have a school where they have a cell tower mast near the school. Half the kids will get brain cancer in a year. I mean, it's just... It's really, really dangerous. And so that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about it, but also don't want to instill fear. It's like, again, just use common sense. But I think it would be... I think people would be doing themselves a disservice to not at least build some awareness and mitigate what they can, even right. if they don't go totally off the deep end. But it's, well, it's really the most important issue that we face with our health. Yeah. And before we move on, because I feel like you just opened up a can of words, I at least just want to touch upon for a second, because my listeners know that my wife and I started purchasing uh, some additional properties that we're doing for short-term rentals. We're out here in Sedona, Arizona right now. And you've been to Sedona. I think I've seen... Oh, yeah. you're lucky. Yeah. Dude. I- Sedona. Yeah, was, yeah. Girlfriend, she's never been there. I'm like, oh man, we got to go out to Sedona. I'm secretly, she might hear this someday, but I'm on Zillow all the time and I have my places I'm looking and Sedona's in my Zillow search, man. Because she's, she's like, I don't want to move to some small town. But I'm like, let's go to Sedona. Check it out. You know? Dude, you, you sound like me right now. I, I'm on Zillow like three times a day checking the newest listing. So we'll, we'll talk. And I got a place for you when, when you guys come out. Hey, nice. You know, we had to learn a lot about real estate and stuff. And you learn about the dangers of things like toxic mold and stuff, right? And people yeah. take that very seriously. Like, like, cause I go through, I was like learning through online courses and stuff like, all right, what you want to check for when you're doing your due diligence? And they're like, you know, black mold and stuff like this really is serious. Like not just serious in the health effects, but like as a business owner, the cost that is associated because they air seal the whole room and, you know, I have to have the whole hazmat suits to like extract it. And it's like, this goes up to thousands and thousands of dollars. So you talk about that to somebody and everyone's like, okay, this is serious. Why, when you talk about something like this, it becomes so polarizing? As so many people are like, they said that that uh, phone towers were dangerous too. Like, and I did have somebody who made an argument saying, "Well, if this was really harmful, then that would mean every cell tower operator would be dead by now." Why is it that it causes so many people that when they do hear this, it just says this is ridiculous? Well, the first thing is when technicians that work on the towers work on them, they're turned off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, you know, ideally, that's yeah. the way it's... Why, why aren't all fireplace and chimney sweepers not burned alive when they clean a chimney? Well, because there's no fire going on. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. It's called cognitive dissonance. It's 
I'm putting my head in the sand. I'm covering my ears. La, 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 la. I can't hear you. La, 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 la. It's We don't want our framework of reality to be interfered with. This is the dogmatic scientism. It's the closed-mindedness. It's the fundamentalist view of medicine that Western medicine is the only way that alternative healing and cures are invalid, that you know, taking a vitamin C IV when you have a virus isn't going to do anything when it's been proven that it does. Things like ozone therapy. I mean, there's, there's been so many things throughout history that have come into practice and proven to be efficacious for different health issues. But because there's not an incentive from big pharma to market them because they're not patentable and anyone can have them, then they get kind of thrown into the witchcraft bucket. And it's similar, especially with the issue of EMF, because sadly, some people still trust multinational corporations that have an interest in their bottom line and being profitable more so than they do in public health and safety that people have a hard time accepting the fact that that is the case. And we can look back at asbestos. We can look back at lead paint, leaded gasoline. We can look back at cigarette smoking, you know, Mm -hmm. all of these things, even in recent history that were deemed to be safe. They've proven it safe. Well, who proved it? And is there a conflict of interest in terms of who it is that's claiming that safe? So in this particular case, we'd have to trust the FCC, who is the regulatory agency that controls where towers go up, how many of them, how telecommunications companies are able to apply for the permits to put them up, etc. Do you trust any of the acronyms? I mean, honestly, do you really trust the FBI, the CAA, the FCC, the CDC, the WHO? I mean, do a little bit of research. Think yeah. critically, man. Yeah. Look at history and the ways in which human beings have been used as lab rats for corporate interest. The fracking industry, you know, these farmers that can light their sink water on fire in the kitchen because of the chemicals getting into the water table Mm. of their well, into their aquifers. It's like Big Brother is not looking after you. Big Brother is looking after corporate interest. And I think people have a hard time accepting that there are people on earth that aren't good people like them. I would never throw up a cell tower on your house without you knowing it, knowing Mm -hmm. it's going to harm you. I'm a good person. I have empathy and compassion. Many human beings don't. Many human beings are run by their instincts and they're living at the animal base level of profitability. And it's either me or them kind of mentality. And people have a hard time acknowledging that that is a prevalent state of consciousness, especially when you have massive corporations that are set up in a power structure where one hand doesn't know what the other hand's doing. Mm -hmm. So when you see the technician putting a cell tower up next to the school, is that person an evil bastard that wants to hurt the kids? No, it's just all the information is compartmentalized. And if you ask them, the technician, they'd be like, oh no, it's safe. It's been proven to be safe. By whom? Right. By whom? And do they have a conflict of interest? Have there been third party testing? Uh, has there been third party testing done to prove that one thing is safe or not safe? You know, this is what we see in the vaccine industry now and all of the things that we have going on with one side pushing for vaccines and then demonizing anyone on the other side that said, okay, well, maybe they work, but can we just test to see if they're safe? <laughs> nope. You're an anti vaxxer. You're right. deleted. You know, right. it's just like, This is the dogmatic closed-mindedness that we live in. So to me, it's like, A, I don't share information with people unless they ask. I I drive by on my street every day, a cell tower that's right outside someone's bedroom window. And I really grapple with the moral responsibility that I feel to write them a letter and say, Hey, I don't want to interfere in your business. You didn't ask me, but you might not be aware that you live next to a cell tower. And there's a lot of correlation between that and people getting ill. Mm. And I don't do it because it's none of my business. You know, it's not, I'm not God. It's not my job. If they went door to door and said, Hey, Luke, I heard you're into health. Do you have any suggestions? I live down the street at that brown house. I'd be like, (laughs) Yes, thank God you asked. Move, man. Move now. Sell all your shit. Get out. (laughs) Yeah. You know, so it's, if people don't want to know, then fine. That's their, it's their fate, destiny, karma to suffer the consequences of their ignorance. And that's, mm-hmm. and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with getting sick and dying of cancer. That's your journey this time. And, and that's yeah. okay. If, right. if that's what you want to do. I, I don't like to interfere in people's lives. I know when I was you know, a drug addict, all I ever heard my whole life was, you need to stop doing drugs. It's going to kill you. And every time someone told me that, it made me do more. Right. 
Right. I was like, don't tell me what to do. Don't yeah. interfere with my worldview. I'm identified with this lifestyle. This is who I am. This is what I do. And I don't care how dangerous you tell me it is. I like it. So you can tell someone, you know, sleeping with a Wi-Fi router next to their head is going to give them brain cancer. And they're like, I don't care. I like Wi-Fi. Right. <laughs> you know? It is. It is. It's fascinating. You know how that happens. It, it entrenches a lot of people more into their behavior and their their beliefs. So, and then you, of course, are exhausted, giving all your energy and power away <laughs> to trying to convince somebody of something. So, yeah. But I know our listeners are. Uh, Keeping an open mind and heart. <laughs> Has it been an hour? Did your uh, did your Instagram end? It's good. It's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm hoping we could do just kind of like this quick, you know, I don't know, intro or list of some of the other topics that you dive deep in that I have found really fascinating. You mentioned, you know, blue light, which I still know so little, but I got the glasses that you recommended. I've already had an infrared sauna. It was recommended to me several years ago. And I swear by it, but I know you do a lot with infrared. And is there anything else that can at least, you know, because someone who's going to go check out your podcast next is going to see like 280 plus episodes. And it is a lot, like, but in, in the best way possible. When it comes to, you know, alternative health and creating, you know, so putting some of these biohacking things in place, what are some other areas that people could quickly start to look at? When investigating your podcast, for sure, yeah. There's there's kind of two categories of this. There is the category of products and practices that cost money that are add-ons and they're bonuses. Mm-hmm. Then there's the category of practices modalities that are essentially lifestyle changes. And the reason that both of those I believe are necessary is because the underlying root cause of human pathology and all illness that we see now, and even to a large degree, mental illness and psychological disorders, etc., in my view and in my experience, have to do with the fact that we're cut off from the natural world and the elements of the natural world. And so we have become voluntarily, through our own ignorance and laziness and addiction to convenience, We've become domesticated zoo animals in a self-built zoo. Mm. And and I stole a lot of this from my friend Daniel Vitalis. So I always like to give credit where credit's due. This concept, really, I learned from him, but it's I've seen it played out and I've expanded on it. And you know, it's not all him, but this idea, the way he presented it to me was because he's he's a wild man, you know, he's a hunter, forager, gatherer, wow. uh, just you know, lives mostly on the land out in Maine. Very sophisticated, educated guy, but you know he lives in nature, and you know lives in a house, but lives from the land as natural as possible while still being a normal guy and having an email, you know. <laughs> but it's this it's this idea where you look at a wild animal that's taken out of the wild and put into captivity. So, say a bear, a tiger, a monkey, right? You take them out of their natural environment in which they would have had fresh air, they would have been exposed to sunlight, they would only see sunlight during the day, not at night, Mm. they would not have artificial light ever, they'd be eating a hunter-gatherer diet, and they would be free to move and to roam, and they would be forced to move in ways that were natural and functional according to their needs. And they'd be swinging from trees, they'd be digging holes, they'd be burrowing, they'd be running, they'd be jumping, stopping, swimming. Just imagine wild animals. And when you watch them operate, the ways in which they move and how they eat and the water they drink, and they're very much in sync with nature. And it's just part of the natural order of things. Well, human beings are also animals. It's just that we've been outfitted with a prefrontal cortex, which allows us to make ourselves more and more comfortable. So you take a wild animal and you put it in a zoo, you cut it off from its natural habitat, its ability to move freely, its ability to be under starlight, moonlight, sunlight at the appropriate times of day, to be in sync with the cosmos and its circadian rhythm, to sleep as long as it's meant to sleep, to have a nervous system response that is natural where they get aroused by fear or threat, predation, weather, That threat goes away. They stop being threatened by it, go about their business. Think of a deer that gets startled, runs, freaks out, then just goes back to eating Mm -hmm. grass 10 seconds later. You know, when you watch animals in wild versus animals in a zoo, when you put animals in a zoo and start feeding them zoo kibble, feeding them water with chemicals like fluoride and chlorine, chloramine in it, et cetera, 
those animals inherently get sick and die before their time. And what human beings have done is we've created a zoo for ourselves called a house, an office building, an apartment. And we spend, unfortunately, many of us, most of our time inside that zoo cage that we've created for ourselves because it's convenient, it's easy, it's comfortable. Everything we need is at our fingertips. In so doing, removing ourselves from our natural environment and our connection to the earth, literally our being grounded to the earth. The earth has a magnetic and electric field just like our body does. And we're born you know, of the earth and go back to the earth. We really are a part of the ecosystem and we've disconnected from the ecosystem. We wear rubber shoes. We light our world at night with what you referred to as blue light or non-native blue light, which is any light that's not gold, amber, or red, which is the color of firelight that we mm. would have evolved to have been exposed to at night. And we're drinking water that's not water anymore. It's been processed and become something else, like a pharmaceutical H2O at best. And we're eating foods that have been hybridized, that have been cultivated by an agricultural system that systematically takes the medicine and the flavor out of our foods. We're not eating animals that are from the wild, that are eating from their natural environment and have a biodiversity of flora, fauna, et cetera, that they're eating. And so... Everything about our human lifestyle is the antithesis of living in alignment with nature. And so it stands to reason that we're going to develop the same sorts of pathologies that animals in captivation do. And what we call these diseases is diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, strokes, autism, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. And these really are diseases of lifestyle, not only from the foods that we eat that are so disconnected from the original source of our food as we would have eaten as hunter-gatherers, but there are also foods that have now been polluted and our light environment's been polluted and we're looking at computer screens and lighting our indoor areas at night and tricking our brains into thinking that it's noon when in fact it's 1 a.m. Mm. You know, So everything we're doing is out of alignment with nature. And so to me, the fundamental first step of achieving physical health is doing everything we can to get back into nature. And if we live in a city and we can't do that, then how can we simulate nature within our environment? So that's where we start mitigating EMF. We start changing the temperature or the color of light in our environment when the sun goes down. We also have grown accustomed to living our entire lives at 68 or 70 degrees because we have the technology to control our environment. No human beings ever live at the same temperature, except perhaps the human beings that have evolved to live around the equator, where it's typically you know within a 20 degree range most of the year or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. We're never too hot. We're never too cold. So this is where getting outdoors away from glass, away from eyeglasses, contacts, sunglasses, getting the natural full spectrum of light from sunset to sunrise is how we've evolved. Getting in saunas, as you said, is a way that we can evolve and create a hot day when we're not experiencing one inside. Getting in ice baths or cryotherapy or cold bodies of water as often as possible to stimulate our nervous system, to build that resilience to our environment because the indoor environment is so passive and allows us to become so weak and caught in this inertia of comfort. So the low-hanging fruit to achieving health is just identifying what it is that's making you sick. And what's making us sick as a species is being indoors, period. Yeah. It's crazy though that it it can sound so simple. And I, I love how you laid that out because it kind of negated the simplicity. You're just like, oh, go outside. <laughs> you know, because we grow up where everything you're describing, we grew up with that cage. We grew up in that zoo. So it's like I didn't grow up any other way. So it was it's like the normal, you know, it's the expectation. And gosh, I just it's so funny just being out here and going on at least two hikes a day and just being in nature more. Like I feel such a difference. Such a difference. It's also when you, you know, because we are so myopic as a species and we only see the here and now and what's normal to us. Mm-hmm. It's like, what? Of course, I'm going to flip on the light switch at 8 p.m. when it gets dark. Like, what? What are you, an idiot? Why would you walk around in a dark house with amber light bulbs, <laughs> which is what I do? But if we step back and just, you know, imagine a bar graph, right? Or a, a wave graph of the quality of life and human health and longevity, not only how long we've lived, but how well we've lived throughout history. If you were able to see, and I'm sure this exists somewhere, a graph from beginning of recorded history for the human animal at the advent of agriculture, 
say, 12, 15,000 years ago, when we developed the technology to give us the ability to remain sedentary and sit on our asses all day long and grow crops rather than hunting and gathering, that's the very point at which you see the degradation of our life ways and health and also mental health. That's also when you see the introduction of military, when you see the introduction of hierarchy, of suppression, of slavery. Hunter, gatherer, wild people cannot be enslaved because they're able to fend for themselves and Mm. provide for themselves. When you become dependent on the slave master, aka the land owner, the land lord, this is where you become disempowered. And so even culturally, in terms of not only our personal health, but our collective mental and physical health as a society, when we got you know the God-given idea to start growing our own food and sitting our ass in one place is when we began to take a nosedive. Now add to that the advent of electricity and the incandescent light bulb, there was another huge dive and a huge rise in you know epidemics, pandemics of health of all types of nature. Then moving now to where we are into the GMO food and into the electrification of our environment beginning, you know, first, as I said, with the advent of electricity, Mm -hmm. putting that in our homes and offices, but then in the military with the advent of radar, sonar, then moving into wireless communications that we find ourselves in now. And if you really zoom out and look back 20,000 years, what you're going to see is like, well, depending on how you do the graph, you're going to see a nosedive of death and degradation, or you're going to see this massive spike in pathology and illness. And now we've accepted that when a woman's pregnant, that she's ill and she's sick with a baby and has to go to a hospital where sick people go to die and have surgery and get pumped full of drugs to have that baby to begin your life. So you begin your life under the premise that you're sick as Mm. an infant, right? Then if you're a boy in, in many countries like this one, you're genitally mutilated, you're vaccinated, then you live a life maybe on... GMO food and indoors in an unnatural environment that not only doesn't allow the body to thrive, but doesn't allow the soul to thrive. When I was a kid, I was out catching snakes, jumping in rivers, riding my bike. I was a maniac. I was a little (laughs) wild man, a little Tarzan. You know, thank God my parents had the wherewithal to allow me that freedom. But think about kids now that just grow up with their head in a tablet, you know? And so we start our life in this hospital and then live a lifestyle that leads back to that veterinary office, going back to the zoo analogy. That eventually we just assume that it's normal and natural that we start having to go to the doctor and take drugs and surgery and end up essentially dying in a hospital or an old folks home, which would be like the geriatric ward of the zoo that we've built for ourselves. And this sounds, you know, it sounds kind of (laughs) doomsday-ish, but I mean, really, if you really think about it, that is kind of where we are. So can we go backwards and not do agriculture anymore? If you're like my friend Daniel, you can hunt, gather and fish 80% of your calories. You can collect spring water like I do, like my friend Daniel does. I mean, Mm. you can kind of live off the land, but it's pretty hard unless you want to go live in a yurt, you know, in the tundra somewhere and be completely off grid. I mean, it's not feasible for most people. So the answer is, again, in building this awareness and like you said, taking a couple hikes a day, like building your lifestyle and manifesting a lifestyle and a way of earning a living where you can spend as much time outdoors in the natural world as possible. And if you can't live out there, then spend as much time as you can. And when you can't, then create an environment within your home that's as close to that as possible. Leaving windows open so natural light spectrums are able to enter through. Having plants in your home, playing in the soil of those plants and getting that bacteria on you. Having pets that you live with in your home. I've recently learned is a great way to improve the biodiversity of your gut biome. We're we're meant to live with animals, right? Yeah, wow. there, there's all sorts of different kind of hacks you can do to still be able to have Netflix and Google and your cell phone and all of you know indoor heating and air conditioning, all those things that we love. But you know, mixing in different things like wearing blue blocking glasses or the biocharger of having you know magnetic fields that are healthy magnetic fields that we get from the Earth. I sleep on a, something called a Magnetico that mimics the passive magnetic field of the Earth that has been lost just due to the polar. A shift of the axis of the earth and activity on the sun and all sorts of geeky stuff. <laughs> so there's ways that you can, you can mimic the natural world in a way and still live the lifestyle that we have. But I think first one has to understand like what the problem is before you start finding the solution. Mm. Man, this is uh, wow. 
just the way you describe it gives people such a unique perspective to look at things that you just we tend to not look at, you know. So <laughs> thank you for. I mean, I, it's just to get people to think. Yeah. You know, and not that it needs to be as extreme as you know, like go return to being a hunter and gather. But this is huge, man. It's so powerful. So thank you. I was debating to ask this question because it came up. So it'll kind of be like my last one. And then, you know, again, this is like I, I said to you and I'm saying to our listeners again, this is, this is a doorway into a whole world that you have such a knowledge on. I'll do my best to link up to as many episodes that really send people on these, on these different paths so you can go deeper with these topics. You mentioned vaccines a bit. It's been a topic that's come up with my audience. They've asked me about it. It's popping up in these times right now. Do you have any episodes right now where you've talked to people about the effects of vaccines? What's your take on it in the like, you know, shortest abridged version? Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually an easy one to to make short because I'm not a virologist and I'm not an expert in immunization, vaccines, immunity, etc. I will <laughs> I'll start out by saying if and when I have kids based on the experts that I've interviewed for the past four years. Many of them will not say this on record, but I ask them privately. I'm talking about celebrities. I'm talking about some of the most knowledgeable and brilliant doctors in the world. I've asked almost all of them if they vaccinate their kids. Unequivocally, 100% of them have said off record, no effing way. Not one shot ever. Okay. So there's that. So in my own perspective, and this is going to trigger a lot of people because again, the indoctrination, the, the, the dogma, dogmatic point of view that we just believe big brother and I heard it on the news. So it's true. You have to really, you've got to look at the historical reference of government agencies and how historically, and not all of the time, not all of the people, there's a lot of amazing, honest, well meaning people that work at the CDC, that work at the WHO, okay, at the FDA. But there are also a lot of corrupt and evil people and greedy people there as well. And so to just blindly trust the directive of these authorities that have put themselves in positions of power, sometimes, sometimes they've been voted into power, but quite often they just assume power. I mean, you have someone like Bill Gates, who's now like become the world expert on vaccines when he has no medical training or background whatsoever. Yet, if you're someone on Facebook that says like, hey, my kid developed autism two weeks after she was vaccinated, could we look into this? Then you're crazy because you're mm. not a health expert and you, you have no medical training or background, right? Yeah. So for me personally, looking at the history of infectious diseases and looking at the quite obvious side effects of many of the vaccines and not just the vaccines themselves, but the frequency and the multitudes of those vaccines and how soon they're being introduced now. And every generation, there's more and more of them being introduced sooner when that infant has not developed an immune system and hasn't developed resistance. Some of them aren't even necessary at the point at which we give them. Many of them are very suspect in terms of have they actually been proven to work? You go back and look at something like measles or polio. If you look at the correlation between sanitation practices and refrigeration, especially if you look at the measles, that particular issue in correlation to vaccines, and again, going back to a graph, I mean, anyone can look this up. Measles took a freaking nosedive when we invented refrigeration. And then after that came the vaccine and there was relatively no change, maybe a 5 or 10% decrease, but it had already flatlined. 100% 100% due to sanitation. You have to understand people used to do surgery without washing their, their goddamn <laughs> hands. And so like we realize, oh, germ theory, right? Which yeah. is debatable in and of itself. But you know, sanitation, sanitary medical practices, the ability to store food without it going rotten, growing bacteria, etc. That's what's really stopped pandemics and plagues of the past more so than the effect of vaccines mm-hmm. in my own opinion and experience. That said... You know, if you elect to have kids, then until they have their own rights to choose for themselves, you as a parent have to choose and use discernment. What my position is, is not that I'm anti-vaccine, although, you know, personally, I would never take one and I would never give one to one I love, unless and until it was absolutely 100% proven to be safe and effective. Right. The fact is, because of the financial incentives within the industries that promote 
this idea of vaccinations. There's so much conflict of interest that arriving at a place where their efficacy and safety can be proved is way, way far off. And so my position is not anti-vaccine. Maybe some of them work. As I said, I'm not an expert. I just have not seen any proof of that. I know a lot of people get the flu shot and they still get the flu. So Mm. why would I go get a flu (laughs) shot? I also know people that have had close one person had a close relative that died from a flu shot. That's like, you know, one degree of separation from me. That's just one example. So my position is pro-safety protesting. And I have a podcast with a gentleman named Del Bigtree, who's often mislabeled as an anti-vaxxer, although he's not. He's a pro-safety testing proponent and made a film called Vaxxed. And now a film called Vaxxed 2 was demonized, was banned, was censored erroneously and unfairly because he has kids and he became knowledgeable about this. Robert Kennedy is also a very outspoken personality and expert in this area as well. And what these people are saying is if we're going to inject these substances into our young and into ourselves, we should definitely be proving that they're safe first. And we are not doing that. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know what the argument is with (laughs) anything else. It's just like our president yesterday on TV, you know, this will become dated, I'm sure by the time it comes out, but he was talking about alternative possible alternative treatments, such as uh, UV light, you know, running someone's blood under UV light, which goes back to World War II. It's known to work, it's effective against viruses. Um, So is ozone, by the way, which I'm surprised he didn't mention that. Then he talked about, you know, certain disinfectants. And then the news, the fake news took that and said, he's telling people to go inject Lysol. You know, it's like, Right. I found that a little peculiar because I, I didn't hear that, but everyone's saying he's... If you watch what he said, uh, and because I went back and watched, I was like, no, he never even actually talked about inject. He just, you know, anyway, it's a whole yeah. other thing. But what I find so strange about that is that someone will go get a flu shot with fetal material with, you know, mutated RNA and DNA and preservatives and mercury. They'll give their infant, their newborn infant, a shot of that without thinking twice about it and questioning it. But when someone says, hey, maybe there's a way we can, you know, run UV light to disinfect someone's blood and get rid of a virus, that's just insane. Don't listen to him. He has no medical background. It's like, well, why are you listening to Bill Gates? Right. You know, I mean, maybe Bill Gates has a little bit more knowledge about something than the president does, but it doesn't matter. It's not about right or wrong or left or right. It's just, we're so beyond that. And we have to get beyond that division. We have to start thinking critically and thinking for ourselves and, and demanding the right to ask questions and demanding Mm. the right to not be required to do something that has not been proven safe to us or to our families. And I just firmly believe in that. I have a very libertarian stance on that. If I'm not hurting you, then leave me the F alone. <laughs> Completely. And the premise of, well, if, you know, say like you don't vaccinate your kid and your kid comes to school with my kid and gives them measles. Well, wait a minute. Yeah. I thought your kid was vaccinated. If vaccines worked, why are you worried about that? Do you see the logic in that? It's like... That's dude, the ultimate argument right there. <laughs> yeah. Let's use some common sense. And then you get into the herd immunity and all that. It gets quite complex. The point is, and again, my position is just, man, do a little research and mm-hmm. don't do that research on Google and don't get that research from CNN or anyone that has a conflict of interest and has a vested interest in causing you to think one way or another. Like be an autonomous adult and have an open mind and think critically and really start to look at some of these things until you can really decide for yourself rather than being told what to believe. Anytime I'm told I have to speak a certain way or behave a certain way or believe something that I've been told without making up my own mind about it, it's very suspect about anything. Right. I think in general, we can both agree in this interesting time that we're in, more people are beginning to do that. More people are beginning to you know, ask questions and think for themselves, think more critically and with more discernment, do their own research and pay attention. And I think... And I know you mentioned this on another podcast and it just resonates so much is that whole concept of the law of duality. You know, when there's that one side, the other side, that opposition, you know, balances it out. And we are seeing a lot of light right now. A lot of lights being turned on. And that's to me always the silver lining. And it, and it goes back to what you said earlier. It's like, I always believe and operate from that idea. It's like everything will always work out. But that's a choice, you know, we make to like live from that place now. So... Luke, this has been fantastic. I can only imagine how brain opening this has been for for our listeners. And I feel like 
getting to know you from your podcast, this is barely just scratching the surface. I don't even know how you could do an episode with this without it being 10 hours. So, um, (laughs) (laughs) I know, man, I, you know, it's funny when I first started my show, I, I, yeah, I looked at what other people were doing and I, I took Dumas's course. Oh yeah. John Lee Dumas. Yeah. Podcasters paradise or something. Actually, to be honest, I paid someone to take the course for me and then launch my podcast. But you know, I looked at what they're doing and okay, first episode is your origin story, then you know, niche down to a very narrow niche and all these things. And I tried to do some of that and and, and make the shows only 45 minutes to an hour. You don't want to lose people's attention. And I just I tried to follow the rules and I couldn't. <laughs> and I think the more I deviate from those commonly held beliefs about content, the more successful I am. And yeah, some of my shows will end up being three or four hours. And I'm not like watching the clock going, Hey, how long can I stretch it out? I'm trying to get to the end. Right. But I know when I still feel passion in my heart and when the guest still feels passion, I feel it. It's just like when a light is turned on or off, it's like, it's very palpable and noticeable. And so I just keep going as long as I feel like the conversation's on fire. And the minute I feel the passion is starting to wane, I'm like, okay, so thanks for coming on. And we, we wrap it up and it's, I've quizzed my audience, my Facebook group and stuff. And like, do you guys want me to make these shorter? And 95% 95% of them are like, nope, keep doing what you're doing, man. We listen all the way through. So Love it. Well, thank you for giving so much time here on my show and to our listeners. Again, I guess... Because I, I didn't really say it all. I love said it in the intro. But what's the next step? Where should people go to connect with you? Obviously, I would assume that's your podcast. Yeah, the Lifestylist podcast is really the mothership. I mean, that's that's where I really bring together all of the ideas that I'm passionate about. And You know, as we were discussing before the recording, my business model has been sort of strange to me because I think a lot of people have a product or service that they want to market and then they start producing content of high value, hopefully, to lead people to their product or service. And because I was pivoting in such a diverse way from my former career in fashion and in Hollywood and all that, I had no product or service when I started making content. So it was just like, make the content and monetize that content through affiliate marketing and podcast sponsorship. And even 4 years in now, I've just been having such a great time doing that. And I do a lot of public speaking at conferences and events and things like that, that I just haven't gotten around to having some like, Hey, yeah, I'm on your podcast, James. Everyone go buy this thing. There's nothing to buy. Yeah, It's just like follow my content and learn and enjoy and share it. And if someone hears one of my episodes, man, text it to 5 of your friends. Like, that's your donation to the show. And you know, that's that's what I'm doing for now. Although I'm in the process now of writing a book and I was putting that's together awesome. a retreat right when this thing hit. So the retreat got kind of sidelined and put off for a bit, which is kind of the next phase of the business model. And so, you know, now I'm finding an alternative way to build community and yeah. share some time with people digitally, remotely, etc. But as for now, yeah, it's the podcast and then my most popular social media platform would be Instagram. I'm at Luke Story. I'm very active there, especially in the stories and the live feeds like this one right here. So if you want to get a sense of like the behind the curtain, real deal, authenticity and rawness of like all things Luke Story, uh, Instagram would be the place to find me. Well, I'll go ahead and link that up, both of those up for our listeners. And again, I've I've purchased so much just from, you know, being educated on your show from even just little things like the Royal Jelly that you that you recommend oh. all the way up to the $14,000 biocharger and everywhere in between. So everything that Luke has mentioned here and this was, you know, my decision to do that. I'm going to make sure that you guys have a link in the show notes to the product and to any episode that does a little deeper dive if you want to with his uh, link as well. And again, guys, I cannot stress enough. I've gotten so much value from this guy. Like just just a wealth of knowledge and I and I just so appreciate you and and the work that you're doing. So, you know, keep it up. Here's to another 300 episodes. Please, you know, let me know if you want to come back on when the book is ready so we can we can get that out. I just uh, thank you, you know. Thanks yeah. for coming on. And thank you. And I also am a fan of your podcast. We didn't cover that earlier. No, we didn't. I, I, that's awesome. I listen to a lot of business and marketing podcasts like Amy Porterfield's yeah. and yours. And I'm, I'm very much like savvy and interested in that. It's just not, it's not my area of expertise per se. So I don't go on shows that are focused on that uh, yeah. as a guest typically, unless somebody wants to kind of take a sideline like you've done with me today. But <sighs> totally. I, I love your show. And I think that work you're doing is really important because the paradigm of business and entrepreneurship is evolving so fast. Yes. And I think that people have opportunities to go from a bartender to, you know, 
I don't know how much your you know your revenue is at this point, but it's a lot. It's impressive, especially from where you came from. Yeah. And I truly believe that everyone has a gift that allows them to have financial freedom if they're able to mm. discover it and learn how to build a business system that works for them. And the old paradigm, especially now, so many people are going to be starting over. So I think you're really adding a lot of value in the True. world. And yeah. as someone who just kind of pulled a new career out of my rear end at, um, like, what was I, 46 years old or something, like, if I can do that, I believe anyone can. I didn't know anything mm. about marketing, podcasting, content. It was all new to me. And I just learned from people like you and you know, taking you know, online courses like B-School and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> and the, learn the basic fundamentals of, of how you do what I do. And, and lo and behold, it's working. So thank you yeah. for um, your input as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Luke. Really, really appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for tuning in, making it to the end. You're still listening to us. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, you made it to the end with us. And then, you know, this is a relevant, important conversation. I invite you next to check out the links we have directing you to some specific episodes or just, you know, dive right in. Go down that rabbit hole with Luke. He'll take you on a journey. That's definitely for sure. So thank you guys so much. And I'll see you on the next episode here on the Mind Your Business Podcast. Take care. 